Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our panel discussion to better understand um, our tribal communities and the issues impacting them. Um, my name is Gerald Bahulano. I'm a corporate communications manager here for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona, and I'm going to be your host today for this discussion. Um, I'm also a member of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. So we're really lucky today we have some special guests that are joining us, and I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves before we get started. And we will start with Thosh. Thosh, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, it's good to see you, everyone. It's uh, good to see you. Anya Pjogik, Thosh Collins. Anya Ia Amjad, Anakamir Aatam Jovitka. Um, I'm from right here, the Salt River people's land and what is now known as uh, Tempe, Arizona. I grew up uh, in my community, my reservation, Salt River, and uh, currently live right here, as, as I mentioned, in Tempe with uh, my wife, Chelsea Luger, and my two daughters, Weston and Allo. And um, my uh, wife is from the Standing Rock Sioux and Turtle Mountain Chippewa people. And together, her and I have a indigenous wellness initiative and consulting business that we call Well for Culture. And we started that in 2014, and we've been working throughout Native country, working closely with uh, the Native Wellness Institute, which is the board that I sit on. They are based out of Oregon, and they've been working in Native country for about 20 years. So a lot of our work is, is with Native Wellness Institute, but our, our work exists to help and assist in this current movement for reclaiming our health and wellness and our indigeneity as Native people and, and helping to be a part of this movement to heal um, from the persisting impacts of colonialism. And so um, that is the work that we are doing uh, in our communities. Uh, we like to use the virtual online platform wherever it's appropriate as well to share our message, inspire and connect with uh, other young indigenous people as well as uh, um, have things to share with the non-indigenous communities, things that are, that are appropriate and um, right for us to share. So that's a little bit of, of what I do. And I just want to uh, give thanks for today. I wanna to give thanks for each and every one of you I um, want to give thanks to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona for putting this panel together and having myself and these awesome colleagues on here to share our perspectives. It's a really important thing. So I wanted to uh, give thanks for that. Thank you, Thosh. Looking forward to learn more about you. And now, um, Holly, can you please introduce yourself? Oh, I think you're on mute, Holly. Oh, there you go. As well, the Guang. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for gathering here with us this afternoon. I'm Holly Figueroa, I'm the tribal liaison for Health Choice Arizona. Um, <clears throat> my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I, I'm here in Flagstaff. Uh, I serve Northern Arizona and Central Arizona uh, through Health Choice Arizona, working with uh, 17 tribal nations, uh, as well as our urban Indian population in the realm of healthcare, uh, both physical and behavioral healthcare. Uh, so really working to make sure that we are providing programming and education in relation to accessing healthcare, uh, making sure that we are educating um, folks on how to stay healthy, but also <clears throat> more importantly, educating our providers on the importance of tribal sovereignty, uh, making sure that they uh, are able to operate as good tribal partners um, within the different tribal communities within our state. Um, and then on the other, on the other side, uh, working with tribal nations, making sure that they also have education and information to help them with their decision making process in relation to healthcare needs for their tribal communities, uh, especially during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, making sure we're staying connected to them, making sure they have resources, and continuing on past uh, to help them remain resilient. So uh, a lot of work goes on there, um, a lot of travel, a lot of communication, um, a lot of understanding of our, our different tribes, making sure that we understand that they're all very different in culture, language, traditions, government structures, um, laws, policies, all those fun things. And so, uh, so that's a lot of what I do. I come from the Hopi Nation, Second Mesa, Arizona, which is Northeast Arizona. 
Uh, and so I'm very thankful to live here in Flagstaff. It's about an hour and a half away from my, my travel land, but unfortunately, um, I haven't been able to go home because of the pandemic. Our villages have remained closed, um, but we do, we do sometimes have to go back, you know, unfortunately to send our loved ones off in a good way. Um, so we've had to deal with that. Uh, so a lot of loss, a lot of grief. Um, I have two children and I'm married and uh, my husband also works in the health field. So that's really helpful. And my children are <clears throat> grown and off living down in the valley. So that's very stressful, but, <laughs> but you know, that's part of them moving forward and on making their own lives. But um, as I was growing up, I came through the military. My, my father served in the Air Force. My husband served in the Air Force. And so living this civilian life for the past 21, 22 years was quite the culture shock. Um, so that is uh, part of what I bring with me. Uh, I've had a very different upbringing. I didn't grow up on the reservation. Um, so I had to do a lot of learning really fast. Uh, but I also brought with me a lot of um, the different cultures uh, that I experienced through the military growing up, um, you know, through the Catholic Church and then having some identity issues once I was in my 20s. So we'll talk about that more, but uh, that's who I am. Uh, I have a cultural competency background, so I bring that along with me. So I do work with a lot of other cultural groups in addition to tribal nations. So thank, I'm really excited about this time that we're gonna have and just kind of have this conversation. And I'm really excited about the invitation to participate. So thank you, Aspale. Thank you, Holly. And I love your background. I just want to remind people who are joining us here today that it is Native American Heritage Month and we are recording this session. And so this will be posted on, on Planet Blue and in Blue Buzz in the next couple of weeks. So you can share this with your fellow employees who didn't have the chance to join us here today. All right, so now I will go ahead and let John introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, you know what, for myself, my name is John Canyon. I'm from Navajo. Both my parents uh, grew up on the Navajo reservation up in Cameron and I'm in the Window Rock area. So for myself, I am very similar to Holly's experience. I grew up in the valley and um, a lot of times my family members would, you know, throw me up there for the summer and put me to work for a couple months and I would come home and that's kind of how the routine was. And there was a lot of different experiences I went through that and, you know, it can made me who I am. And so as I went through school and working in different arenas, worked in a biotech arena, specifically working with uh, tribal communities for diabetic wound care and working with different technologies, specifically stem cell therapy to help and think outside the box uh, for different type of opportunities to help with the healing process and uh, neuropathy and so forth. And so that's what the tribal, um, you know, different clinical case studies I was helped to put together. But a lot of that was just building relationships. Um, and as we kind of discussed further on, probably in these conversations, it's about trust and relationships was a key factor. And when I was first introduced to that arena, I found out all the behind the scene things that happened to tribal communities, the reason why the walls were up. And I was just blown away. I know I, I grew up in the culture and I grew up um, with different tribal members. And, but to hear, some of the stories, I'm just, I was blown away that I'm like, no wonder there's all these walls up. No wonder there's no more case studies or clinical case studies because all the things that happened. So, you know, there was a passion that started there. And some of the wounds I saw in the wound care, I mean, there were literally holes in their foot and you can put your finger through the hole. Oh. And they were like, can you heal this with some of your stem cell therapy? I'm like, there's no healthy tissue to help. So I thought to myself, I can get five years before this even happened. And, uh, and you know, Mr. Collins probably knows a lot of healthcare and diet and nutrition, but if I can get ahead of this, I could provide an opportunity and a chance for this patient. And so we, I teamed up with a group that actually scans the eye and it takes about a six second scan and it can tell if you're diabetic five years before the actual blood test. And so that's what some of the technology I bring to the arena. So I, I work in this arena and I'm, I work in also in the opioid um, we actually have a device that sits on the ear and it can actually help with people who are going through the detox program, but there's no additional chemicals, no additional type of um, prescription drugs associated with it. But, you know, just thinking outside the box became my, my passion. And some of the things that we can do to bring 
some quality technology that can actually make a difference for different type of um, communities that don't have the resources, don't have the funding, but what can we do to bring that? So for myself, my background, I sit with the American, um, the Arizona Association for Economic Development as some of the tribal economic development chair. And that opened up a whole new arena of working with different type of organizations and companies that are non-native to work with tribal communities. And that's where I learned a lot more about this trust relationship. And so I sit on the board for the American Indian Chamber of Commerce of Arizona. I also sit as a, um, a tribal, tribal kind of liaison between the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. So and as advisory council for them. And so all these different type of opportunities and sitting and listening and learning, I, I found out that there was this common thread, which we'll hopefully we'll talk about today. And, um, but it was, it was a very interesting path that this all led up to. But uh, very thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, Mr. Collins, Holly, I, I've been, Holly and I have had work in the past before, but one thing I learned about Indian country is once you start doing the movers and shakers, people who are actually making a difference, you're going to always cross paths. And, and I thought that was very amazing to see this opportunity to be here today and, and share my experiences and share the things I've learned and seen and witnessed. And um, I hope today everyone comes with an open heart and an open mind. And, and I know one thing about this is as we start sharing these opportunities, there's going to be a responsibility. And I hope those who are listening, uh, especially from a leadership role, take that responsibility and actually do something with it. So that, that would be my goal today. And I share that with an open heart, just with the opportunity just to um, create a difference and, and create a pathway for that. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, so um, I am so excited to be here and to get this started. Um, I'm not Native American myself, I'm, I'm Filipino, but one of my best friends is, is part of the Navajo tribe and he actually let me spend the night in his family's Hogan um, in the Tuba City Reservation. And that was a really special experience for me. So when I was asked to host this panel discussion, I was um, immediately excited. I knew I had to jump on this opportunity. So we'll go ahead and get started. I just wanna remind everybody that if you have a question as we're discussing, to please go ahead and put that in the chat and I will try to get your questions answered um, towards the end of this discussion. Um, so my first question is, um, actually, I'm gonna ask Holly this question. Earlier, you mentioned access to healthcare, but what are the other main topics or issues you're passionate about as they relate to indigenous people? Um, I would say uh, other issues and topics that are important is really just having a better understanding of, um, you know, we talk about cultures within culture, uh, which is an impact, you know, in relation to healthcare, social determinants of health, which could be anything from food, um, access to healthcare, firewood, transportation. Um, and I think when we talk about our tribal nations that we serve, some of them are in very frontier rural areas, which mean you know, it might take you anywhere from uh, 20 minutes to two hours to get to a grocery store where you get fresh um, vegetables or good meat. Um, so social determinants of health are, are very important issues. But then when we look at cultures within culture, if you will. Uh, I work a lot with our veteran communities across uh, Indian country. Um, our two-spirit LGBTQ uh, populations, which also there within themselves experience stigmas and they experience um, uh, some of the uh, suicide ideations and thoughts and, and all, of, uh, all that goes with uh, suicide ideation um, in attempts, unfortunately. Uh, so I think that there are many issues, but I think the best way to kind of talk about all of them because they intersect with so many different things is really understanding what those social determinants are of health are. Also understanding that every tribal community is different, even within a tribe itself. So I can speak, you know, I mentioned I'm from Hopi. My village is Sabalavi, there's 12 villages. Um, across three different mesas, and they all vary um, in different ways. Um, some are closer to uh, grocery stores, and some are not. 
Um, some of the languages vary in dialect, and so that's also something to consider. So I think, um, you know, having those understandings, understanding what is important to those tribal communities uh, and that are helping them to point them to resources, uh, better understanding how we are able to offer support and guidance um, related to what their particular issues are, their priorities are, but also offering information. Um, that's that's a lot of times what I'm doing. I'll get phone calls from different tribes and it could be anything about, you know, are you guys doing more firewood this year? Or it might be, we need help finding um, housing for some of our COVID positive um, families. And so it, it's, it keeps me on my toes because I think, you know, issues um, vary by tribal community. And so those, those are kind of the areas where I'm, I'm very much um, having to stay on top of information, um, making sure that I have uh, resources. I just got a call last night from uh, one of my um, Two-Spirit colleagues uh, about a veteran, a tribal veteran from the Cherokee Nation who landed in the Mayo Clinic who needs help with resources because he is not able to receive help from his tribal nation because he's not there. So the complexities also of systems of care can be uh, a really big challenge as well. So uh, hopefully we can, you know, work collaboratively to find some resources for for our relative who unfortunately is, you know, at the Mayo Clinic right now. So a lot of different areas that I'm very passionate about uh, in the work that I do. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I know towards the end of this um, panel discussion, we would love to hear more from each of you about how we can be allies with you in, um, you know, making and affecting positive change against these impacts that are affecting your community. So I'm going to ask Dosh the same question. Um, what are some of the issues or topics that you're passionate about related to Indigenous people? That's a great question. There's so many and, and I share a lot of the same concerns and passions as Holly had already outlined as well. And today what 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 I'm really concerned about within our communities, especially since the onset of the pandemic and the era of social distancing, the era of virtual learning and virtual interaction, and soon to be on the horizon, augmented virtual reality is coming. Um, I have some concerns with, with how our health and wellness is being affected during this time. And we have heard anecdotally, we've also seen data that has shown that there has been an increase in um, depression, um, anxiety, um, as, as suicide ideation, as it was already has uh, mentioned. There's all of these, these current health disparities, modern diseases, diseases of modernity that are, are increasing as a result. And um, it's exacerbating what we already have, uh, have had a trouble with since the onset of colonialism. And so one of the concerns that what I'm seeing just in even in my own family, my own community is, is the, the, the withdrawal from this person to person interactions that we are kind of seeing in our communities and particularly amongst our youth, amongst our youth and those that are battling um, depression and those that are battling addiction. We're seeing th this withdrawal and this, this, I guess, kind of um, people becoming complacent and content with being in social isolation away from um, community, uh, family, uh, cultural gatherings, and, and all of our, the experiences that we have at our community cultural gatherings that aid in our healing and our wellness, our ceremonies, being outside on the land, being next to fire, hearing our songs, tasting our indigenous foods, um, you know, being, um, having healthy affection to our relatives and our friends. And I think that that's one of the real concerns that we are, are seeing as it is in, in our communities. And, and those are some of the things that I've been um, thinking about myself lately on, on how can we, how can we tackle this issue and how can we do this in a safe way? Excuse me, my car started next to me. How can we do this in a okay. safe way um, to where we are still offering social distancing options to our relatives here at high risk, you know? And so these are some of my real concerns and I'm sure that other panelists too have these concerns. And we've seen this too in the families, you've seen this in the communities as well. So amongst all the other concerns in our communities, such as we already see a high prevalence of, of substance abuse, addiction, 
um, alcoholism, uh, all that. Also, um, we are have, as we know, as Native people, uh, we have um, higher rates of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and violence against uh, the Two-Spirit community. And so these are things that are of real uh, concern within our communities that, that outside uh, Native people, um, health care organizations, um, people out there living, you know, on Indigenous land should be aware of these issues and find out how can we support and how can we allocate new resources and create new policy and legislation that will aid and assist in some of these, these new um, challenges that we are experiencing. And I think that these are some things that are, are, are on the horizon of, of, of being more challenging, as I mentioned already, with, with uh, virtual reality being the next phase of the internet. And there's some real concerns with that. So I think I'm also trying to think ahead to you about the current health disparities that we are faced with. How will those be exacerbated even more? And, and how will these the incidence of these be increased um, by some of the new um, you know, uh, technology that is, is, is coming our way? Um, but technology is good. As John had already outlined, there's many great um, technological advances, particularly in healthcare, that, that will aid and, and help our people in, in health and help our people to reconnect with one another. But that's just a little bit in a nutshell, you know, some of the things that, that I'm um, concerned other than uh, what we already kind of know in Native country. Thank you. John, same question, or do you, can you let us know, like, what are any barriers to addressing or raising awareness about some of these issues that Holly and Thosh just talked about? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, when COVID really hit, it, it hit the Native American community, indigenous communities the hardest. And, um, and a lot of different tribal leaders got to see the holes in the boat of what they needed. And, you know, I asked, I, when, it, when COVID was on the peak, I had the opportunity to sit in a meeting with the tribal leaders and one of the CDC uh, representatives. And I was a fly in the wall. I couldn't really say anything, but I, so there was a question the leaders kept on asking, how can we prevent this from happening again? And the CDC representative basically said, get your people healthy. And mm -hmm. in, anyone who knows the indigenous background is kind of shocked by that answer. You know, if you go back about a couple of years, the same person who represents the same organization who said get your people healthy are the same people who remove them from their traditional lands, removed them from all their diet, their traditional foods, gave them flour, uh, all the stuff, and they just made the best they could with it. And they survived in a whole different arena. And here we kind of hear this answer, get your people healthy. And I was kind of blown away by that answer to, a per to an individual who doesn't know all the background and i think that's one of the problems that we have with our indigenous communities is that no one truly really understands the background you know and we hear the same background people saying just get over it, it that happened many and we see as indigenous communities indigenous leaders and indigenous representatives we hear this phrase um consistently in different areas so it always blows me away uh when it comes down to that and, you know, you know, Tosh probably knows this better than anybody, but two generations ago, our, our family members didn't have the same diet. We had a complete diet. Now we're wondering why we suffer from diabetes. Why do we suffer from high blood pressure? Why do we have all these health concerns? I mean, we were removed from our traditional lands, we were taking away our diet, our nutrition, our traditional diet, taking away some of the culture we couldn't sing, how we were meant to treat people. Now we're like, all these things were just taken away and we're kind of fighting through this as a next generation. So, and that's one of my passion is just to figure out how can we bring this back together? And as Holly said, there are a lot of this is like almost a domino effect. When something happens, another thing happens. And as you take away diet, nutrition, it, it just snowballs into this big thing. And how do you get above it? And the one thing I am passionate about is the technology. A lot of technology is phenomenal. They're making some amazing discoveries. It starts up here, but it never makes it down to, the, to indigenous communities. If it does, it's not really a resource because there's no funding for it. So we kind of have this, you know, we're spinning our legs, but we're just like, how do we make this connect? And so one of my goals is I, I work with different type of um, indigenous communities I'm from Arizona. I worked in Oklahoma, economic development. How can we stand on our own two feet? 
on the economic development. So I bring different ideas and opportunities to indigenous communities for, you know, opportunities for, let's say, manufacturing N95 masks, for example. You know, if that was something that a tribal community could get a hold of, I know Navajo Nation has done something with gloves and they're being very successful with that. Cherokee in Oklahoma has created an opportunity for uh, manufacturing. So there's a lot of tribal communities as they discover, they start being creative. They start thinking outside the box and they start being successful. And a lot of these tribes kind of hold these secrets, but a lot of these tribal communities are starting to open up this window, what we did. And what's amazing is I love these stories of smaller tribal communities, especially in Arizona, who are creating this unique economic development opportunity, creating their farms, creating, growing specific um, um, seeds that are in that time period for that season. And I just think it's just amazing what, how this works and how our culture has adapted. I, I recently, there's a, there's a great show, um, it's called, uh, I think, Gather on Netflix. And it talks about this lady, I watch it with my kids, and this lady who actually eats this mouse and, you know, at first my kids were kind of grossed out by it, um, but, you know, we are kind of explain afterwards is that this mouse eats different things. And so that was really amazing that they would eat these different things and they would be able to go ahead and then, so they couldn't eat it directly, but it can eat it through the mouse and it brought such value. And that same story talks about eating bison and buffalo and uh, organic. And while what they ate was when they got sick, they would eat this specific plant. And so when they ate that meat, it made them healthy. So it's, again, the same domino effect that we can kind of get back to the basic of what our DNA is. What an opportunity. So. Thank you, John. You dropped a lot of good historical knowledge bombs in there. I don't think a lot of people know that history of of, of Native Americans given limited resources, at like like the flour and the food that you mentioned. Um, you know, on that on that topic, um, how important is it that Americans are taught about the history of indigenous peoples and colonization in schools? What does that education look like for you all? I can go. Uh, <clears throat> I would say it's crucial. It's crucial for everyone uh, to understand the history of the first peoples of this land. There's so many things that have happened. Um, and if we're truly being trauma informed, we need to understand what that was, what that history was, what those experiences were. Uh, because a lot of these experiences weren't that long ago. Um, and so it's really important. I just got out of a presentation that I hosted uh, from the U University of Arizona, and they're working on mandating that every um, faculty and staff person uh, receive training in relation to tribal nations um, within Arizona. If you're going to work for the U of A, you need to understand that history. Um, just because as non-Native entities and organizations wanting to collaborate and partner um, and be on this land that belong to the first peoples, we need to be respectful, knowledgeable, and understanding of what that is. Uh, and a lot of times we know that some of our tribal communities are hesitant in partnering with outside entities and agencies for a lot of different reasons. And, um, you know, there is an expectation sometimes or an assumption about um, tribal people, you know, first peoples stereotypes. We see it all the time in relation to the criminal justice system, um, in relation to substances, um, alcohol and substances. Um, and so if we don't understand where that comes from or where it stems from, then how can we approach it and understand it and be respectful um, in, a, in a good way? So I would say it's very important. I do a lot of training for providers, um, partners, um, universities on what it is to be a good tribal partner, what it means to understand sovereignty, what it means to understand colonization, and all that that came with that. Um, the boarding school era, the Indian Removal Act, um, you know, giving disease infested blankets to children and women, sterilization of women so that they would not reproduce because they were trying to, to get rid of the first peoples of this land. 
um, all the abuses, sexual and physical abuse that came along with that. Murdered and missing indigenous women and, and people that we're talking about now has been going on since colonization. Many women have been taken from their homelands um, by outsiders. And so we're just now talking about it, how many hundreds of years later. So it's really important to understand uh, what that means. Um, I, it took a long time for us to get to the point where we're at right now, but I think the more we educate, the better the understanding is, the better the trust and the relationships will be. And uh, really finding who those champions are that help to create those, um, those partnerships and those linkages uh, because, you know, the, we have such um, a beautiful land, we have such beautiful tribes who are very different, and, and I always, you know, I enjoy my, I love my job, I'm probably like one of the, <laughs> the goofy ones who I, I truly, I can truly say I love my job because I get to work with other tribal nations, I get to know their culture, I get to understand uh, some of their ceremonies and rituals, and, and it's really beautiful to see how that impacts their well-being, how it impacts their perception on health and wellness, um, and how when they go back to that, they, they recenter. You recenter yourself and you can move forward in a good way. So uh, I would say it, it should be mandatory um, for all non-native agencies to have some sort of a training session uh, requirement if you're working with tribal communities or indigenous people. We have over 40 different tribes represented here in our state of people who make Arizona their home from other tribal communities across the country. Thank you. I would agree. And just like Holly said, she already outlined the many different um, historic atrocities and how those persist today and how those are, it's really critical that those are taught and that that history is, is understood and I believe that this is something that should continue to develop this, this discussing this, how this will take place. I think that we need to can get many different minds at the table um, from native communities, state educators, uh, legislators getting at the table to find out what's the, what's the way for, for them to teach this true history because it's, there's no way to sugarcoat this history. And, it must be told and appropriate terms must be used, appropriate terms such as forced assimilation, forced removal, um, the boarding school era for what it is, the, the use of, of sterilization, uh, sterilization of indigenous women, um, the, the, you, the direct use of sexual assault, sexual abuse to, to take power from people, you know, to further assimilate and acculturate. Uh, to, to disempower, you know, our people, our children, that all these things needs to be taught and at some point so soon, and it's coming to surface. And this is an opportunity, I believe, to teach about empathy and to teach about how to take accountability and responsibility. And some people will say, well, this wasn't my family, my history, but all non-Indigenous people have benefit from this history. So there's a level of, I believe, accountability that many can assume that role. It's an opportunity to teach empathy to the young generation. And we know it, with the way things are in this country, with the heated social political climate that's been since, seems really exacerbated since 2020, really since 2016, um, it's an opportunity to, to teach empathy and to teach human connection once again and teach people about, let's look at our similarities as human beings. And, and it's an opportunity to um, teach others that it's wrong to dehumanize us. When people understand our history, they might be a little bit more empathetic to our needs as Indigenous people, the needs to our, our health care, um, our education, and our policies. But I think that this is really critical that these things must happen and the appropriate terms must be utilized. And I think that we will, we will face uh, resistance from um, people in dominant culture, as we've already have seen that there's been a resistance to critical race theory. People don't like that. They don't like to know these, these, these true histories because it's uncomfortable, it puts them in an uncomfortable situation, and it makes them take accountability and change their behavior after. And some people are not ready for that kind of change, but we need to start somewhere. And I think that we need to teach people outside in native country, like 
like like Holly had said, this has been happening and many of our, our leaders since the 60s have been advocating for this. It's just since the boom and social media and social justice and activism that these things are finally making the surface. So non-Indigenous people, people in dominant culture need to understand this is not revisionist history. They're just barely hearing about this because of the internet has exploded because of this streamlining of knowledge and information through social media. It's always been there and many people have, that, can, have been advocating for it. So I think that we have to continue to, to do that and to leverage our allies, leverage our allies as we do this. But yes, lots to be said on that. Thank you. Thank you. I just received a question um, in, on this topic. How do we move past knowing we need to educate the masses in school settings to get the governing school boards to agree and move forward with revising the lesson plans and academic tools? Any thoughts on that? I, I think that a lot of times, you know, is is painting the picture. And if you don't mind, uh, I do have an image I would like to share to kind of talk about what we're talking about here. Sure. And, um, and this kind of really brings up a new perspective. Let me know if you see my, you see my kids or see the picture of the boy. I see the picture of the boy. Perfect. Okay. So this picture, Greg Deal is the artist and he shares an interesting perspective. He's an artist. And uh, as an artist, you do what you do to kind of put money on the table. And he talked about that there was this traditional Native American art that people wanted. Um, have it be the horse on the landscape or something with the reservation or something that was too traditional and that's what sold. And so as an artist, he started becoming more passionate about telling this story. So he created these pictures and this picture is about a boy that was taken to a boarding school. And most, most natives who are, are dark skin, um, their knees and their elbows were a little bit darker. And so the person who was in charge scrubbed that dark areas until it bled. And it bleeded his knees and, and this little boy is alone, taken away from his family in a whole new arena, taken his culture, probably cut his hair. And because of his dark skin and because of those areas, the person thought they were just dirty and wow. just scrubbed that to bled. And that poor little boy went to bed. And the next morning, in the middle of the night, they found that he bled on the sheets. And that little boy was then taken and was beaten. And all the children could hear his screams and his cries. And it was beaten to the point where he was no longer crying. And none of those kids saw that boy ever again. Wow. That is the story. That is the history. And when we talk about this picture, this not only hears the story, but it shares and it just touches your soul. And so when we talk about the opportunity, what do we do? Um, you know, for us internally is getting our people on those boards, getting our youth to be the leaders of these arenas, getting our youth and the people to take action and become a part of it. If you're not from the reservation, you live here in the city, it doesn't mean your responsibility is done. In fact, you have more responsibility. You have wow. to share the stories. You have to be the leaders, the people who step into those roles. On the other side, you know, working with different organizations, it's the Blue Cross Blue Shields who partner with tribal organizations to help share that story that stands side by side. These organizations that they, or the school that depend on, it's different when you hear the parent, the student, but when you talk about your partner within your school organization saying, we need to change something. Now you have, I call it the sandwich effect. You got these partners, AR, ASP, Blue Cross Blue Shield, all these organizations, you have a different story. You have someone in your corner. So when we talk about tribal organizations, we talk about partnerships. We talk about relationships. We talk about those organizations who feel and know and truly want to make a difference. And I think Mr. Collins mentioned that there's this big boom. There is this boom. And as tribal organizations, we're getting people who are like, oh, we're contacting these tribal organizations. Hey, what can we do? And you're like, a part of you is like, great, I love it. But are you going to be here a year from now? Are you going to be here two years from now? You know, and what we look at as a tribal communities, as we look at those organizations that were part of us five years ago, who are trying to make a difference then, we'll take anything we can get, but it's one of those organizations that invest into it 
and are a part of it and they really try to make that develop. Just want to share that. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to add on to that, Don. Um, I, you know, we're still on this topic about understanding and being taught the history. I think, you know, we all think it's, we are very passionate about that, but I think too, I know that, you know, you said it very well, Fosh, it's, it's, we can't, we can't sugarcoat it. You know, th these are really hard um, things to share and hear and just looking at that image kind of makes you, ooh, you don't want to look at it and it creates feelings and it creates emotions which, um, you know, that's, that's part of the conversation. That's part of the experience in history. But so what do we do after that? We can teach, we can share all of these things, but then what? I think it's really important then to have that call to action or what are the next steps? And really understanding the power, you mentioned power. Practicing the cultural humility once that information is shared is even more crucial understanding what it means to practice that cultural humility. Okay, what do I need to understand about this tribal community? Or what do I need to understand about this person I'm engaging with in whether it's a personal relationship or a business relationship, whatever it might be. So that it's not the person of power up here and then that other person down on the bottom, we really need to understand how we can meet each other in the middle. And I think that that's what Western society teaches is you have a power struggle. You have the person that has all of what they want to talk about and what they know, and they're going to keep it from the person that they're trying to help or the person that's asking for help. Until we can get to the point where we can build that foundation of cultural humility and put it into action, um, I think we're going to kind of see this hesitation to, and in, in, in a sense of, of scariness and understanding that that culture, that that experience, the traumas. It's we know it's not pretty. We hear about it. Our relatives tell us about their experiences in boarding schools, and it's not it's not nice. But those are the influencers that uh, tribal families have and why they're, they a lot of times seem like they do have a chip on their shoulder. They're not trusting of anyone from the outside. I mean, look at what Deb Holland is doing with the boarding school um, uh, movement right now. What is, what is the review going to, it's not going to bring any of those kids back, but it's really facing the realities and the experience that is the cultural piece of bringing peace of mind and closure to those tribal communities and their families and understanding what that culture means to those uh, communities and to those families, which is sometimes a lot deeper than the act itself. So cultural humility, and I think it's just having that put into action. You know, Holly, you mentioned cultural humility. I wanna get back to that, but John, thank you for sharing um that powerful image and you are right we can't echo enough how much representation does matter and can really make a difference um my, my next question is kind of on that same topic it's um how do you maintain your culture and values as you all move throughout the world i'll go ahead and jump in and share that but i want to thank again holly and john for those yeah great comments and I also want to just add to the previous question that sure. you know that systemic change certainly has to happen from the top and and how that is done I personally don't have the solution for that but I can say that that some of these things may take generations and we have to we have to be patient and we have to continue to to chip away at it and teach the next generation both native and non the next generation about what, what a healthy community looks like for everyone, what, what, health, what health equality looks like, social economic equality looks like. We have to continue to paint that picture um, because it, it will take generations. It takes generations for things to get the way they are in this sense. And I think that it, unfortunately it may take a little bit longer and unfortunately more, of our, more people may suffer in this, in this process. I mean, it's a really unfortunate thing to say, but I want to encourage people that, um, you know, these things need to start. And some of us, um, I've heard elders say, I'm okay with knowing I may not be alive to see these changes happen, but they're, 
but they are starting it now and they're content with that. They'll be in spirit watching these things, you know? So I, I think that everyone should be ready to kind of take on those, those, those understandings, even though that we are making some leaps and bounds, like she said, you know, with um, uh, 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 Secretary Deb Holland and where she is and, and the, 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 uh, the initiative, the boarding school initiative that she's been put forth, you know, it's lots of great things that are happening for sure. But to answer your question too, you know, how do we stay grounded? And I think that, um, you know, one of the most important things for, for us as indigenous people to always remember is that our ways, our, our spiritual worldview, our cultural practices are really timeless and they can be applied anywhere and they can be applied um, no matter what era we're living up in, living in. Uh, many people think about when we talk about cultural uh, revitalization or cultural um, preservation, I think we're talking about going back and, and to, you know, completely getting 100% of our caloric intake from everything we plant, forage, hunt, fish. They think that's what we're talking about. But what we're talking about is learning about how do we find, how do we leverage our teachings that keep us walking in a good way in, in, our, in our modern world? And, and people are doing that. Many people are doing that. And, and it's important for our young people, indigenous people to understand that our cultural practices and our, our ideology, our worldview is not dated. It's not dated. It's not an old way. It's, it's just a way of life. It's a way of being. It starts with our mind there. And I think that it's important for people to um, look at what were the elements in our people's, original people's way of life that allowed them to be, you know, indigenous people. And that was their connection to the land, their connection to the people, their use of ceremony. Um, and within all of that understanding your place in this great interconnected web of life, understanding your role in that. You're not at the center of it like dominant culture teaches, but we are a part of this, you know, inextricably connected uh, network of living organisms that we all have a role within it. We have a role to be, walk on the land. It's a good relative, it's a good person to honor all living beings, the four-legged, you know, the fin, the winged, to honor all the plants on the land there and to try to interact with those and to, to keep ourselves grounded in, in our humanity and our humanness by, maintaining connections to those and to each other. And of course, um, for those, that's for our native people who may not have access to their cultural practices, you know, get outside, mm -hmm. um, breathe, honor the air, honor the sunlight, honor our fire, our mother earth, the water, honor these basic elements that provide life and stay connected to them because in our world today, it's easy to become disconnected to the true givers of life. And it's, it's important to understand this. It doesn't come down to just one. From my understanding as indigenous people, it's not just one thing that provides like in dominant culture or Western religious ideology. They narrow it down to one, one president, one God, one this, one that. In our understanding, it's this, this complex network of various entities and organizations, excuse me, <laughs> entities and, and people that, that contribute, um, organisms that contribute to our world. And that's who we give thanks to. You know, We can give thanks to water, but we need air. We got to give thanks to air because we can only go several, you know, minutes without it. You know, we give thanks for food, of course, all these things right here. I think it's important for our people to just to basically understand those elements. And of course, if they're involved in their community and they're raised in their community, they can look to their cultural practices, their songs, their language, the ceremony, all of these things keep us grounded. It teaches us how do we walk in, our, in this world today. And it teaches us what's appropriate to utilize from technology and things from outside of our culture. How do we leverage those things to help aid us in an appropriate way? Because we have to evolve too. I always say we're preserving, we're revitalizing, and we're evolving. We give ourselves permission to evolve, I think, as Native people. We, our people have to understand that, that they have the permission themselves to evolve and to bring in things into their culture. We're already doing that, such as John had outlined the technology that, that we've already been using on um, technology and healthcare. Um, you know, dialysis that has helped to, to, to extend people's life and, you know, uh, delay the onset of diseases, uh, things like that, you know, technologies is there. As Native people, we can indigenize that and continue to use that where it's appropriate. But um, that's just a little bit what I have to say on that, that topic there. Great question. Gosh, I love that you said that your culture and your beliefs are timeless and they're what keep you grounded. Um, we, have a, we have a question in the chat. It's where can we learn more about your history and your culture and your traditions? Uh, I know for myself, it was really interesting because I, you know, I grew up learning a lot about different um, Navajo culture, and um, I had a chance to work with Gila River uh, on some of their, you know, projects they had. And so part of Gila River's process is that you have to go through a culture sensitivity course through them and you have to understand 
their tribal community and what their tribes are. So if you're a nurse who's been hired by Gila River, you have to understand the stories. You can't understand. Yeah, I, there was a story he shared that one of the nurses had a lanyard that had owls on it. And, you know, and a lot of different elders, she would come into the room with this on, would not want her to be there. And she never knew why, but there was a, there's a culture component associated with that. And just not knowing that is, is kind of hard. And, you know, and so I think there's a lot of different organizations and tribal communities who offer this. And a lot of it's just going out there and finding it. Um, a lot of times is getting situated with the chambers. There's the American Indian Chamber of Commerce. There's different organizations. There's Native American Women Association for okay. entrepreneurs. And, you know, there's all these different organizations out there, but being a part of it and learning it from it and, you, and going through that process. And what I do love is, uh, you know, with the whole COVID, me and my wife decided to homeschool our kids until the dust settled. And here was an opportunity where I could bring anything I want to the table. It wasn't their history lesson. It wasn't their social studies, that book I had. So what I did was I connected to all the people I knew. I'm like, hey, what's a, I, here's my situation. What's a good book? What's a good thing I could teach my kids? And this, it just came through. And I was amazed in some of these things where I could teach them about the culture, what really happened, and to understand who you are. And, and one of the questions he asked earlier was, how do you identify yourself, um, you know, continue moving forward? There's an interesting statistic. There's only like three things in the world that you have to determine your blood type. It was dogs, horses, and American Indians, and Native American, indigenous community, indigenous. And um, I thought that that was crazy to know that, you know, for my children, I, I don't want them ever to feel they're not indigenous enough, that it's part of them. You know, you know, how far we might go in the future, there's always going to be a part that's always going to thrive. That's always going to be a part of them. And if you identify with that and you grasp that, take it. And everyone, you know, you know I tell my children that, um, you know, you do, do your best. They're, they're half indigenous and half um, Hispanic. But um, sometimes they, my, my little boy, a quick little story, came home and um, he was told that he, one of his friends told him he couldn't play with him anymore because he wasn't, he wasn't wide enough. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think everyone on this panel has had something like that happen to them. Yeah. And when it happens to your kids, it just, you know, for you, you kind of go through it. And that's just part of life. But here was my first time that I had to sit down with my, my son and kind of educate him through the process. And um, so that was interesting. And so that's one of the things I, you know, you know, Mr. Collins shares a lot about, you know, identifying and letting that be a part of you. And that's why I shared with him at the moment was you be you, you, that will be, a, this will always be a part of you and that will give you strength. And so, you know, that for myself is always trying to learn how to identify with that and continue to move forward. And it is, it is, it is, it is balance. It really is a balance. And especially in the professional world, you know, it, it's an interesting perspective, but those who can, who I've, identified as my mentors had walked me through that process and how to do it. So yeah. I think for myself, it's just sharing that experience. Thank you, John. And then we just have a few minutes left and you mentioned UBU. So my last question to each of you is to let us know really quick, quickly, what does being Native American mean to each of you and how can we be an ally to your community? We'll start with um, Holly. And Holly, thank you for putting those details in the chat so people can know how to learn more about um, your history, your culture and traditions. So I'll go ahead and let you start. Sure. Um, <clears throat> can you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. I was uh, uh, what does being Native American mean to you and how can we be an ally to your community? Mm -hmm. And just uh, really quickly, because we just have six minutes left. Sure. Uh, well, I, I would say, you know, for me, um, being Hopi, I'm, I'm a Hopi woman. I'm also Oke Oinge from, from Northern New Mexico. And that's who I am. I'm not native. I'm not, you know, indigenous. I'm, I'm Hopi and that's, that's how I live my life. Um, everything that I do from the time I wake up to the time I close my eyes is Hopi. 
Um, and that's how I keep true to who I am as um, just a female in my community, um, a mother, an auntie, a grandma, uh, all the roles and responsibilities that come with that and my responsibility to, to my environment and to this earth. Uh, we call it everything I do, uh, Hopi, is to serve, um, to be a good servant to my community, to my people, to all the elements, so that when I die, that I'm, I'm going to the next, to, to paradise, wherever that is, whatever that is, that is my goal in life, is, is to be that. So I'm very mindful of what I teach my kids. My son just brought home his first elk kill. And so that was very grounding for me. That was, I mean, it was a proud moment as a Hopi mother and woman to know that that was something we carried on. Those traditions, all the rituals that went into him preparing for that and when he brought it home um, was like a rite of passage. Um, you know, you go outside on your bare feet and you go stand on the earth, not on the cement, not on the sidewalk, but you go step out on the, on the earth and you breathe that air. Those things, those little things that we do every single day that we teach our kids, that we teach the next generation are what is important to me. Um, and I carry that over to my work, you know, the respect that we have, that lomakatsi, that good life that we're trying to live is being respectful um, and being welcoming to everyone and being the best servant that I can be um, to my people, but also uh, as a, a small ant that we call it in Hopi in, in, this, in this world in doing what I can do to help uh, create positivity for myself, my family and, and everyone. Thank you, Holly. Do you know how to make beaky bread? You'll have to make me some because I love that stuff. All right, um, same question to Sash. What does it mean to be Native American to you and how can we be an ally? And we just have three minutes left. Yeah, yeah, real quick. Um, same for myself, you know, to, for me, this is to, what does it mean to be in a no, 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 come here at all, I'm a Salt River person is to you know, maintain my, our connection to, uh, to our river and our family goes out there pretty regularly, just even just to be there, to be out there, to be connected to that. And, you know, we make our offerings and things like that. Um, we plant our, our original autumn seeds and we're not growing at the scale we'd like to, but we plant there, we forage seasonally and um, go out and, and hunt during these times and um, honor our songs and just honor our connection to our family, to one another and try to participate in the community, socially, politically. And for me, that's, that's really what it means. And of course, being um, the most I can to to my wife and two daughters to me that's mm -hmm. that's really what it is so I think that a lot of our indigenous ways is about it's about being human and so you know that's that's what it is for me and I think that how organizations like Blue Cross Blue Shield can continue to support Native people is continue to to uh, create incentives to bring Native people on board to work on these higher up positions uh, compensate Native people for for being a part of these these things here, reaching out to the Native community and listening, continuing to hear the voices of Native people is really important and making changes after that. After you assess something like this, they get together and say, how, what changes can we make here and now? What, what can we do now? And how can we build on this? Um, so I think that continuing cultural competency education with all their, their, their healthcare providers and finding out special ways they, that they can assist Indigenous peoples, especially those that don't have access to adequate healthcare that are, you know, mostly relied upon um, IHS. I think that's real important. So there's a lot to say in that, but I'll go ahead and let John answer this as yes. well. Yes, access is key. Um, John? You know what, for me, it's just, I remember my, my grandfather singing songs. He used to sing all the time. And the fire popping at night as I go to sleep and I can hear my grandfather still today singing the songs. Um, and there was one point in my life where something dramatic happened and my grandfather came down and uh, he was a medicine man and gave me a special blessing. And that will always be part of me. And even till today, I, I share these opportunities. When I see my children, if there's an opportunity to teach who they are, who's their indigenous inside. You know, I, I take that opportunity and um, we, we take those moments pretty frequently. And we're, we're, you know, we're based here in Phoenix, but, you know, even now we still have opportunities to share who they are. And um, it's always important. And for myself, it's just always making it a key perspective. 
Thank you, John. All right, and that wraps up our panel discussion. Wow, the hour went by so fast. I know we could talk about a lot of these topics um, for much longer, but unfortunately we only have an hour today. Now, before we close, I just wanna let everybody know who's joining us here today that we're actually launching an indigenous people's affinity group. And we're also launching a women's professional networking group. So more details on that to come and to be posted on Planet Blue and Blue Buzz. And again, this session will be, um, is being recorded and we will be sharing that with employees again on Blue Buzz. Again, thank you, um, Sash, John, Holly, for sharing your experiences and a little bit of who you are today. Uh, we want nothing more than to be an ally to your community and learn more about your culture and your traditions. So um, if you're joining us here today, thank you so much for, for being here and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you all. Appreciate it.